Hello and welcome to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. I am your host, Amanda Testa. I am a sex, love, and relationship coach. And in this podcast, my guests and I talk sex, love, and relationships and everything that lights you up from the inside out. Welcome. If you ever feel like you have potentially done so much in your life for other people and now you're really ready to put yourself first for a change or, you know, you feel like maybe your health has taken a toll on everything you've done and you're ready to take back the reins on your health and you're going to love today's episode. Welcome, welcome. And today I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Jane Dabu, who inspires women to take their turn in health, relationships, and career so they achieve invincible confidence, clarity, and control. And she's also the founder of the Her Turn Movement. So welcome, Dr. Jane. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here and to share with everybody. Yes. Awesome. (laughs) And I would love, I just was so touched by your movement. That's actually how I found you to reach out. And I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about her turn and what inspired and inspired you to create it. Yeah. Uh, so basically her turn, it's a story movement and it focuses on women's triumphs over anything in life. You know, I started out with health, of course, you know, with a lot of my patients and just how they're navigating through today and the lessons they've learned, whether it was health, relationship, it doesn't matter, you know, so you'll be hearing a lot of women's stories there. And yeah, that's basically in a nutshell what it is. And it's, it's like a mini docu-series. So you'll hear these women speak for anywhere between eight to 12 minutes. And uh, I mean, some of them just bring me to tears. I love it after an interview because then I get to watch the rough draft and it's not even final, but oh my God, it's... It's just so great to be able to share women's stories, you know, to the world. (laughs) Yes, I agree. And I think I'm so excited to share more about it and have more people know about it and get involved and share it because I think that's one of the things that we don't often talk enough about is our successes and really celebrate how far we've come. I feel a lot of times maybe there's kind of some taboos in our, you know, around, you know, bragging and being proud of yourself and like celebrating your accomplishments, but it's so important. It is. It's so important because we have this, I think, well, not just women, but, you know, speaking about women, since this is more a women's story movement, we have this ideal that we keep on trying to achieve, you know, when we always forget, like you said, where we came from. And like I always tell my patients, just celebrate the micro wins. And instead of comparing your little win today to your ideal, don't do that. Look at what, where you started, you know, and celebrate that. And there, there's a book on that called The Gap in the Gain, you know, and they say that when you are looking at the gap between you and your ideal, then <laughs> that's where you start living in the gap and you just start being down on yourself, but you need right. to live in the gain part, you know, and that book is by Dan Sullivan and mm-hmm. Benjamin Hardy. So yes, definitely, definitely recommend that book. It's great. It, it, it'll give you a good mind shift there when you're yes, living in the yes. gap. So just pick up that book and literally within the first 30 pages, you're like, okay, got it. Let's go. <laughs> so oh, I love great. that. And I know yeah. not only, you know, part of the inspiration for this is, you know, sharing women's stories, but also you've practiced traditional Chinese medicine for the past 15 years and helped thousands of people that have suffered with chronic illness and health conditions and among many other things. So I'm curious, you know, personally, what maybe inspired you to, to be you know, so passionate about this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Well, my story, I won't talk too long about my story, but my story started in 2005 when I was, became very sick. I was actually working for a large corporate uh, media company in Atlanta and couldn't figure out what was going on with me. I was in my twenties. So, you know, I didn't quite know how to communicate and speak to doctors, you know, it's just like, okay, yes. All right. Whatever you say. All right. Whatever. And I didn't have that ability to ask questions, you know, or be resourceful. And so what happened, what happened was (laughs) I was diagnosed with uterine cancer and it was through that whole journey before I had to come to a decision was that's when I discovered health, my health. And I used to be a professional ballerina and I thought I was pretty healthy. But my definition of health was not just going to the gym and maybe kind of eating right. And I don't know, my definition of health really changed then. And so when I was diagnosed with uterine cancer, 
then I was faced with a question like, what, ne- what next? Is this, is this the end of my life? You know, and here you are in your twenties, right? I was also dismissed by many doctors, like five different gynecologists. It wasn't until the fifth gynecologist really listened to me and he was retiring. And when he told me that day, my diagnosis, he was crying. He was crying for me. Yes. But also crying on and sorry. He kept saying, I'm so sorry because he was saying sorry for all the other doctors that wouldn't listen to me and saying sorry on behalf of his medicine, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. I mean, I realized that later, but before he even could figure out the diagnosis, right? When you are trying to get a diagnosis in traditional conventional medicine, sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it does take many years. And in the meantime, why don't you just take charge of your health? And at least I had a friend in acupuncture school that said, Hey, why don't you go see an acupuncturist? Another person said, Hey, go, go do this, go do some counseling. So I started just doing that while I was in the wings, just waiting and waiting for answers. Sometimes you just can't wait for answers. You have to go out and seek it on your own, yes. however way. But the person that I, and I wish I could find this lady today. I remember it must've been the second or third gynecologist. She was doing an ultrasound on my you know, belly, my lower abdomen. And she goes, you know what? She was whispering. She goes, this lady, this doctor, I know I work for her. She goes, but she's just going to give you birth control pills. That's all she's going to do. And I go, okay, so what are you saying? And she said, here. And she like scribbled down like this phone number. Didn't even tell me what the name of this was. I mean, I was like, okay, it's some random phone number. She goes, just call this phone number. And they do these free workshops outside of Atlanta and you you have to attend it. So I went, I attended it and it was like a functional medicine. I guess it, the, it wasn't really functional medicine. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but I went and they explained the root causes of disease. Then I was like, oh my God. And I kept after that talk, I mean, I was sold. I'm like, let's do it because they were still trying to figure it out. And I just started working on my health, you know? And so let me uh, just go to the end before I had to choose, because they said with uterine cancer, you cannot get the stage of it until you take the uterus out. So I don't know if people know that. So I'm like, okay, so I'm in my twenties. I wanted to have a child. So you're faced with that decision. That was, I don't know if it's a choice, that decision, well, take it out or not. And so I should say I was working on my health with the naturopathic doctors, the acupuncturists, the counseling, spiritual counseling for several months, probably six, seven, eight months. And I kept pushing off the surgery and the doctor's like, you need to stop gambling with your life. But what I noticed in those months I was working, things were changing. I wasn't as bloated, like certain things, you know, in your twenties that you notice, oh, my acne is going away. What's going on? My period started getting better. And he goes, well, you you better get this out, you know? And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to play with my life. I need to know what stage it's that. And they did tell me my cancer was about, I think a golf ball size, you know, tumor. It was like, um, I think in November, yes, November of 2005 is when I had the best period ever. And December 13, 2005 is when I was supposed to schedule for my hysterectomy. And I did fight with them to keep my ovaries. So I said, please let me keep my ovaries. Oh my God. I had a fight with them. Keep they go, no, we should. I said, no, that's it. That's the only, that's non-negotiable. So they went ahead, went through with a hysterectomy just so I could stage it. And then it was June 6, 2006. I remember the pathologist called and said, oh my gosh, we could hardly find cancer. I think you're in remission. You're fine. I was like, what? Did I just heal myself all these <laughs> all these months? And I didn't know in my 20s well enough to even say, hey, can you just check it, do a CT scan again? I, I, I don't know. I didn't know. I just did it because I got a little scared, you know, of course, you know. Yes. So, well, that was basically it. And I celebrated and I go, well, I don't want this to come back. And I just quit my corporate job. I said, goodbye. I'm going to go to traditional Chinese medicine school. And if what I did helped me, this is so powerful because I can go and help other women. So they are not in my shoes ever again. Mm. And everything I learned spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically from just my experience. I mean, it's like priceless, you know? So that's the story, the original story that inspired her turn. But after being a practitioner for so many years, you know, I'm really what's payment is not the money you pay me. The payment is you overcoming it. And I'm constantly, you know, it gets me up in the morning is, 
seeing my patients hearing their stories. I'm like, these stories are so good. Someone's got to tell them yeah, because it's only between you and me in this little room. <laughs> Who's going to hear these stories? You know, so I, I just was like, we, it's her turn. It's her turn to tell her story. That's basically it, you know, and I just love it. I love it so much. And like I was telling you, it's a labor of love. And when these patients, they tell me, but when they watch themselves on the film, they're like, wow, did I do all that? I'm like, yes, you did that. You did that. I know you're a work in progress, but it's still going on. So that's basically what inspired her turn. That was a long story, but it, it was a lot. It was yeah. a lot. That's a powerful yeah. story. And I really want to honor all you've been through and celebrate where you where you are now. And I think one thing that I really heard from that too, is just when, you know, the power of advocating for yourself and just looking for solutions and really doing all that you can to support your health Mm -hmm. along the way, because yes, you never know what might happen. And any, you know, even if you're as healthy as possible, there's still random things that can happen. So it's like, how do you look at your holistic health? And then, and it sounds like that was a big part of it too. Like not just going to the doctor, but also functional medicine and naturopaths and acupuncture and, you know, emotional therapy and all the things. Absolutely. Everything. And that's why I try to impart on my patients. I go, I love you, but I don't want to see you here every day. You're going to have to take charge of yourself, you know, and they have to reconnect with themselves. It's yeah. they've lost that connection to themselves. So if they're not even empowered with themselves, how can they feel in many areas of their life and their relationships and their sexuality and whatever that looks like to them? You know, that's so important. And I find that once they get their health back, oh my goodness, you know, especially if they're mothers, I'm, you know, they've come back, they go, oh my God, my husband, he's not used to this new me. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's different now, you know? you know, because they're not taking the back seat in their relationships or their job or whatever it is. Because I find health is such a cornerstone and people don't prioritize it. They just don't. Once you have your health, I mean, you can't live if you don't have your health. Right. You know, you can't make money. You can't have anything. You just can't. Yes. You know? So, so that's, that's basically it in a nutshell for that. Right. I'm just so happy that when they do come here, it's not just the needles. It's, it's the mind shift when they see me, you know? And I'm wondering too, cause one thing you mentioned is seeing so many women that lose connection to themselves. Yeah. I see that a lot that's as well. It's like you just, and that was my story too. I remember one morning looking in the mirror and had zero connection with the image <laughs> looking back. I was like, what happened to me? And so I'm wondering what you see, you know, how that presents in a lot of women or what are the things that might be holding them back from finding that connection in, in themselves and in their health? You know, some, what I find and what I hear a lot, and it was even me too, as I kept putting other people first instead of me. You know, even at a younger age, you know, that's what I did. Everybody else's needs before me. And that's one of the biggest, I would say, one of the top ones I hear with my patient and even with friends, not prioritizing themselves. And then they find themselves out of alignment. They don't know who they are because they've been living their life for other people. And if you don't take charge of your own health, then, or I'm sorry, health, if you don't take charge of your own life, then your life's just going to run you. And I usually give this kind of visual, like just this plastic bag blowing in the wind or this buoy that's just in the water, just going wherever everything else goes, you know? So I would say that's like the top one, you know, of where that's where people are held back. And then they don't even know how to make small decisions, small choices. You know, I clearly remember my counselor when I was sick with cancer saying, well, just start with, well, what am I going to wear today? What do I feel? (laughs) You know, it's that simple. Should I wear blue? Should I wear yellow? (laughs) You know, I couldn't even make a small choice like that. I know it sounds silly, but you have to start with the small stuff. Do these shoes look good? I mean, I couldn't even make a choice. Yeah. What was wrong with me? (laughs) Well, I think people people could relate to that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, if you're looking to make big changes, it, it can feel overwhelming. So starting with those little simple things can be so huge, right? I know. And then it builds up from there. <laughs> Just start with the small stuff. Even where do I want to eat? Well, I want to eat here. Why? Because I want to, <laughs> you know, and that's it. And stand strong behind what your choice is, you know, be empowered by it, no matter what it is, small or large and gross, you know. Yeah. I think that's the initial thing of tuning in, like, what do I want or what do I need? And then listening and 
It can be the smallest. I love that. You're like, go into the refrigerator. What is it that you really want? Like, <laughs> just what is your body telling you? Right? What are you doing? Exactly. Right? Okay, good. And then celebrate yeah. when you did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just, not just like what making decisions, but they, yeah, they just don't listen to their body too. They lose their voice in speaking up. You know, that was one of my biggest things. I was on mute for a lot of my life. And I'm saying that literally because I was a professional ballerina and they don't speak. We express ourselves through our body. So, and then once I got cancer, oh, I was unmuted then. <laughs> and I'm continued to be, I've unmuted myself. So, and I will speak up and that's it. And a lot of women don't. And someone told me, one of my, I think it was one of patients, she goes, I don't know. When I hit 40, I just started speaking up. I'm like, is it a magic number? What is it? <laughs> Another lady's like, when I hit 60, I started speaking up. I'm like, is it a decade thing? No, maybe it's an experiential thing, but it's important to speak up. That's all. Find your voice, right. be your own advocate and stay strong with all your decisions you're going to make, you know, don't right. waver. And I'm know. wondering what were some of the things that helped you to feel like you could get your voice back? Oh, like I said, it was the small things. And then finding out when, hmm, well, it was a patient advocate, you know, being my own patient advocate, speaking up. And when they had resistance, I would ask, well, why? <laughs> People don't like it when I go, well, why? And oh, goodness, when my dad was sick, oh, I'm sure other medical doctors didn't like me. I go, well, why do you want him? Can you explain why? <laughs> Can you clarify that, please? That was even just asking clarifying questions was also speaking up and getting to, instead of just blindly saying, okay, not asking questions. I think that was a large thing. And then when they would say something that didn't sound, make sense to me, whether it was, I was like, well, that sounds, I mean, in my brain, my brain, go, I don't say it, but in my brain, it's like, that sounds ridiculous. You want me to do what? And then I start asking more questions because the more questions you ask, sometimes they're just on automatic pilot too, telling you things, especially if it's their job all the time doing it. Do they even question why? I don't know. Yeah. You know, sometimes we're just programmed and sometimes asking questions can deprogram other people from the regular, you know, <laughs> here's a script. This is what I'm going to say, because this is what I do every day. You know? So I think that helped me to start to speak up because when I questioned, I noticed there were some cracks there with other people. So, so yeah, questioning why, but not being not compliant. You have to be compliant. Right. I don't want to mislead people, right. right? but you have to do what's right for you. I think that curiosity and really listening to what's inside and you know, naming the things that you're concerned about or have questions on. And I think one of the things that you mentioned earlier too, which I think is just so mind boggling and I never really learned or knew about until I started doing this work around pleasure and sexuality is that, uh, you know, often hysterectomies are a very common procedure and sometimes they are needed mm -hmm. and sometimes they can save certain parts of your reproductive system, but sometimes they just automatically take it all out. And so I'm mm -hmm. curious what, when you had that conversations with your doctor, you mentioned like they were very resistant. How because that's the other thing too. I'm sure it sometimes is scary to stand up to an authority figure of any kind, right. especially if you're someone who's conditioned to please and say yes in our patriarchal culture. So I'm curious how that that's went. Right. Oh, how that went speaking up. Um, a little scary. I remember my heart beating, you know, it's like in my twenties, I was like, ah, <laughs> you know, freaking out, but it was a little voice. And I said, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> and he goes, well, why? And I go, well, because you haven't showed me otherwise I have cancer there, you know, so why would I do that? And then, and then I started speaking out. It was like that. And he goes, well, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Okay, good. And we had to negotiate that. And I said, well, what if I want to have children one day? Oh yeah, that's another good point. Well, if we see that something is off and I go, okay, that's good. <laughs> then we'll go there. Right. And it, another thing I wanted to say to that was and this is something I often hear now. Now I had a male doctor, you know, at that time. And of course he wouldn't know what it feels like to be a woman, right? <laughs> it was very hetero male doctor, right? And this was 2005. And the thing that is never talked about is the feeling, and even my breast cancer women, is the feeling that it's strange, that attachment we have to our breasts and our uterus, our ovaries. I remember feeling a lot of depression about that, not because, oh, I won't be able to bear children, but I felt less than a woman. I was not a whole woman. I was just 
part of a woman. I know that sounds strange, but I've heard that, I, well, not just with me, but sometimes I'll ask my patients that after they've had a radical hysterectomy, you know, hysterectomy, full mastectomy, whatever, oophorectomy, whatever, any of those ectomies of the female reproductive parts. And they feel like I'm not feeling that sexuality. I don't, you know, so it, it's a huge thing that's not talked about. So I, I'm so happy to speak to them about that because I understand that too. Yeah. Of how you feel that. And it, it's a process for sure. You know, it is. And learning to love your body now that there's a yeah. hole there, you know, yeah. right. so I, I think it's, um, you know, it's interesting because as you mentioned that I do know, I have worked with clients who have felt that. And like once they had a hysterectomy, they didn't feel the pleasure the same way or kind of went through the grieving process. And I think there's so much energetically that can be done to just even honor that part because you still have the energetic energy, even if you don't have the physical right. organ. Right. And we just aren't taught how to connect to that, which mm -hmm. You can do and you can, you know, our body is very capable of pleasure and rewiring itself in all kinds of amazing ways. But mm -hmm. I think no one would know unless we talk about it, because most of the time they just assume, well, that part of my life's over. Right. Right. Exactly. And then they just kind of stop trying to be, you know, there's if they're sexual, if, if they want to dress up, they just stop. They stop trying to, you know, I want to feel good and I don't want to because I don't have that anymore, you know, and I don't want them to feel that way. I want them to love their body where they're at right now. Yeah. And at least all you lost was maybe that, but right. you're still there. <laughs> you're not a shell of a person. You're still there. Of course. You know, really, so it, it's been pretty powerful. <laughs> so. I just, I really wish that even it, this is something that I would love to see, which this is, I'm just going to put it out there as a wish in the world. That okay. when women have to have these procedures, that they could be told what to expect or like, maybe you should have a little ceremony for the parts of your body that you're going to lose. Maybe you should honor what you've experienced and really invite this new chapter with love and how acceptance or just even neutrality or whatever feels accessible and just deal with the grief and know that that's part of, you know, having support around that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, I was going to say, I'm so happy you said that because I actually do that with my patients already because I know what it's like. I've been there emotionally, physically, everything. I've gone through it personally. I do that. I, oh, I just did that with someone that was going to get their gallbladder out. Now I know that's not a reproductive, but that's part of your, you know, and the gallbladder was at that point, we try to save it, but there are times when you just have to take it out. It just has to be taken out. You know, it would harm you more than keeping it in, you know, and we had to make that, well, she made that choice. I would honor whatever she would say. And she was so sad. And I was like, oh, but you need to start thanking that gallbladder for saving you. Forgive yourself for not knowing better. It's okay. But now we have to send it off <laughs> and then now give a lot of love to that liver because it's going to be doing the job of two organs now. So now you need to really take care of that place. And so we did a meditation after her acupuncture treatment. She was like, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you for that. So it's funny you said that. That's what I do when people have to get parts taken out of them. Right. So. Well, I figured yeah. that might be part of your practice since, you know, all that you are doing there. And so I think we don't, I just, there's such a beautiful way that, that we could integrate all these different forms of medicine, I think. And I just like to have those visuals of every person that has to have something removed could have a, even I will tell a funny side story is I had to have a tooth extracted the other week for this whole long story. But anyways, I do a lot of um, trauma resolution. And so I work with a somatic experiencing coach and I love that type of work, like really getting into the body. And so yeah. for every time I have a procedure, even I had a pelvic ultrasound earlier and it was an extremely non-trauma informed experience, I will just say. And my, oh. and I, and I'm thinking even just the, I know it's getting better and I will share, yes, it's getting so much better that there's a lot more education around that for practitioners and providers, but for being in the, the, the driver's seat of that, being able to work with someone to like spend some time with these parts and letting them have their experience was huge for both the pelvic ultrasound and the tooth extraction and all the things. It's like, it seems so minor, but there's a lot there. In your there body, is right? absolutely <laughs> no that's a really good story you know i'm so glad you brought that up too besides the aftermath of a surgery or even if it's a tooth being extracted when my patients say i'm about to have this whatever it is this surgery you know i remember a patient and she was about to have a mastectomy 
And of course, there's a lot of fear about that. You know, of course they could go to counseling, but then there's some, another dimension to that. And what I usually tell my patients is, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to create how this atmosphere is going to be. I want you to have a talk. I know this may sound crazy, but I did this with my doctors right before the hysterectomy. I said, could you please, I have a CD and it was like meditation music. I said, cause I know my, my friend who was an OR nurse, she said they do listen to music. I didn't want them blaring some crazy music while they're cutting into me. Right. Cause it's all energy. Right. So what you're, I mean, if you were playing some horrible music that was bad with a lot of, you know, words, it's, I don't want that while you're cutting into me. So I got this meditation CD. I said, please, you have to have, and I didn't just tell him, I told other people on the team, please make sure you play this minute. I want calmness in this room while you're cutting into me. They're like, okay. <laughs> so I did that. I even said, is, is it possible to do some essential? Well, then I couldn't do that because, you know, there's, you want, didn't want an infection. So at least that, and I did, I sat there and I said, let's pray. And I like prayed for them. And they were like, wow, no one's ever done this before. And I sent a lot of energy to them while I was preparing for my surgery, right? That's so important. How you enter a surgery, how you exit a surgery, that, that's what I tell most of my patients. How do you want to create this surgery and really have them meditate on that, right? Uh, and so if they do do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it can change your whole outcome too, right? right. <laughs> I mean, because like you said earlier, we're all just going through our days busy. You know, just like everyone, you're like, I got, okay, got this procedure, I got that procedure, I got blah, blah, blah. Everyone's just busy going through their day. So when you just invite, I mean, right. of course, they're always doing their best to give good care, but just that extra reminder of like, be really mindful. Please be calm as you do this. I love that. <laughs> it's my body, please. I know I might be the seventh hysterectomy of the day, but just right there, this is going to be a special hysterectomy today. We're going to be calm and you're going to be relaxed. You know, and it was funny. And I'm sure the doctor was like, who's this little 20 year old telling me what to do? Right. <laughs> I'm like, seriously, it means so much to me, you know, and I just really told them it would mean the world to me because I'm really scared. And so to alleviate my fear, you doing this will help me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So it, I was probably a lot to ask for a little 20 year old, right? <laughs> yeah. But you know, I think the thing is, is all you can hear is a no and more likely than not, they're going to probably do what they can to work with you to be comfortable. Right. That's right. That's right. And, but they did let me put some essential oils, my diffuser after surgery. I was like, thank you. <laughs> Brought some mood lighting, and, you know, anything to help me in that sterile hospital cold room, you know, it really does. And so when I go visit anybody in the, well, not, maybe not during COVID times, but now we can go. I actually went to see a patient in a hospital. I brought her, I don't know if you could see, you can't really see behind me, but I have this so, uh, I think it's a selenite lamp. I brought her one of those. I brought her some essential oil diffusers. She said it changed a whole entire room. I did some Tai Chi and Qigong while she was laying there sleeping. And then all the nurses told her, I didn't know this until after she got out of the hospital, they all told her, oh my God, we love coming in here because the energy is so nice. You can shift that. Mm -hmm. You really can. So super important. I hope that's a little tip for people out there. I love that. And also because yes, those people might have five call buttons going off at once and they might just enjoy a moment of peace as well. Well, yeah, I think she right. said they liked hanging out there and they're like, oh, I got to go next room, you know, and anytime they wanted to get, they would just stop by her room, which is great. You know, it makes it very calm in the middle of their crazy day, especially in the you know hospital. So yes. they're busy people. Oh, I love this. You know, one other question that I would love to ask, just because I'm sure you probably have a lot of women coming to you, like wanting to get more energy as they age, maybe wanting to get their libido rolling again. Yes. And I'm wondering what you might share around that. Oh, That's energy, it. libido. Yes, it's usually, gosh, it's happening earlier and earlier before it was just, oh, perimenopause, menopause. But now it's like 35. Now it's 28. Now it's I'm in college. I'm like, oh my God, it's happening earlier. A lot of tips around that. Well, diet has everything to do with it. The cornerstone of your health is your diet. What you put in is what you'll get out, right? And boundaries with your time, you know, making sure you're scheduling yourself appropriately. So many times, like you said, we're, you know, people are just running all over the place and we're not intentional, but really being intentional with your time, you know, and who you're spending it with, because you don't want to 
be in situations or people or that are sucking or draining your energy. We got to think about that besides your adrenals. There's those things too. relationships. You know, are you getting what you need from your relation? Are you giving more like that part? That's so important. And just like, of course, where you live. I mean, I get into the feng shui of it. Like what's going on there? Take a picture of that house. Let me see what's going on. That can also drain your energy too, right? So the surroundings is important. The All the external stuff, like I was saying. But then obviously when they come in, then we're going to be doing some physical stuff like the Chinese medicine, the functional medicine that will help the libido and the other stuff. I need to remove all those obstacles that are draining that because I can only work on that physical and the energetics up here, but then they have to be responsible for their surroundings, their relationship, their job, maybe. And it's funny because sometimes if they don't do that part, but once I get that part, like the libido, the energy, whatever, the hot flashes, who cares? Uh, it could be <laughs> regular period. Or if there there's a fertility issue, if we can get that in place, sometimes it just changes everything externally. But I try to get them to do as much externally as that they can control. Sometimes you can't just leave a job, you know, so work on goals for that. So I love trying to give them the best life, not just the best health, because your health is also a cornerstone for your whole life too. So we're trying to work on everything. It's a layered process. I will say it's a process and people don't realize that about their health and their relationships, but there is no magic wand or pill. I don't know who is telling you that, but that just doesn't work. You're going to have to work on it, (laughs) whether it's your sexuality, your libido, everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know there's that new drug that is out there for (laughs) women's libido, which actually, (laughs) yeah, that's not going to solve your problem. It might make you think, and there's a great thing for a placebo, so that's good. Usually there's (laughs) multi-layers, right? (laughs) Definitely, for sure. (laughs) I think it's so interesting. You mentioned too, because there's um, a great book about sexuality called Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski. I just love her very much. She's a sex educator and researcher and anyways, but what she found a lot of times too is really at the root is burnout. And yes, you know, and so I think a lot of this that you're mentioning too, kind of goes hand in hand with burnout. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You can be burned out in all areas of your life for sure. Definitely will mess with your sexuality, your libido, your energy. Oh my God. You can be burnt out on certain people. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it could just be a personal relationship too. You know, I, it's funny, like I was burnt out on, and I'm just going to be very honest here, you know, be very transparent because I've never shared this actually in a podcast, maybe to patients, you know, in one-on-one, but I don't, I don't mind when I got down to the root cause of my issue besides, you know, maybe not being on top of my health a little bit, but I was in a job that was toxic. <laughs> I was in a relationship that was toxic, right? And at the same time, my sexuality too, because I'm gay. It has a lot to do with the uterus too. I was killing myself and not coming to my own, like who I am as a person and accepting myself, right? So that's a huge part. It took me many years, the shame that I felt and shame is a big, it's huge when it comes to cancer, shame. I think I was watching some Brene Brown like video. Oh my gosh, she's great with that stuff. I have to keep watching it over and over and over and over again. But that's a program that's there for me, right? And finally, accepting who I am as a person, loving myself as a person. And from there, that's where sexuality will come in. You know, libido, energy, just living who you are is important and honoring that. Yes. You know? And I find that with a lot of women, you know, whatever it is, they're not honoring a part of themselves and they've shoved it so down that how can you have that? I feel beautiful. I feel, I want to be wanted. You can't have that. If you're not honoring that part of you, you're killing that part of you. I mean, I I didn't know it, but I was secretly killing myself without knowing. I didn't know. I didn't know any better, you know? So I think that's a huge, huge thing as well. So And I'm glad to share that with people, you know, who are listening. So there's something to be said for that. (laughs) And then forgiving yourself. It's important. Yeah. Thank you for that. Because I do think, you know, there are a lot of people that do kind of find themselves at these crossroads in life and are just like, okay, this is no longer okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I've 
been living this lie or I'm yes, trying exactly. to be someone I'm not and it's going to be painful and I'm going to follow that truth <laughs> and everything might fall apart and everything might be even more amazing on the other side, right? That's right. But you have to take the leap. And those people that are not there to support you weren't your friends. They didn't love you anyways, you know, mm. at least cancer. That's what it taught me. You know, a lot of people just I don't even know. They just like scattered. Like it's like at a bar when the lights turn on, everybody scatters or like cockroaches. It's like, where do they go? You know, they're gone. <laughs> and, <laughs> but you know what? All of that, all that toxicity didn't need to be in my life. I needed the right and perfect people. Yeah. And God, that was such a huge lesson for me in my early twenties. <laughs> it was big. And then you ask yourself, well, whose life am I living? Am I living my life or your life or what society is supposed to tell me who I should be, how I should act, what I should wear, you know? Yes. yes. And you can't create a life you love or love the life you live. If you are living someone else's life or from a place of limitation, how can you create your life? You know, I mean, and once you're aware and you get past those limitations, I mean, that's when endless possibilities show up for you. But it's easier said than done, but everybody has to walk through that themselves on their own timeline. You know, so you have to just respect that about people. I mean, that's their life. That's not your life. So who are we to judge? You got to let them be happy. You know, yes. so that's my preaching for today. <laughs> well, I just so I just thank you so much, Dr. Jane, for all your wisdom and for all your creating and the amazing things you're doing. I'd love if you would just share with all the listeners where they can connect with you, learn more about your practice, learn more about her turn and all the other amazing things you have going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I have a couple of things. So, well, you could find me on Facebook under Dr. Jane Dabu. You could find our clinic, Lotus Acupuncture, Lotus Acupuncture Clinic. You could also find me on Instagram under Dr. Jane Dabu. I also have a supplement line called Genesis Botanical Formulas. So you can also find me on Instagram. Haven't quite figured out TikTok yet, but I will get there one day. Now I am looking for delegates of her turn that want to share their story. So if you are interested and you want a little mini docu-series, this is free of charge. If you're okay to share your message with the world, and I'm saying, please share your message. I mean, it took me many years to speak up, right? I mean, we don't want to be selfish with that because you never know, just like that lady gave me that phone number that day how your life will change. Like if she didn't give me that phone number, I wouldn't be here today. I would have been dead probably in 2005. So if you want to share your story, you can make a huge impact and you'll never know who's listening on the other side. So herturn.me and there's a schedule down there. You can go ahead and sign up and, and we'll have someone from our team call you and interview you and see if you, you know, would be a great candidate for that. And I would love to hear your stories because all I hear is what's in my room here in my acupuncture rooms, but I'd love to hear other people's stories too. So there's that. I also have drdebu.com. Genesis Botanical Formulas for our supplements. Soon I will be hosting like a four hour masterclass on your, your turn health live.com. So that's a lot of um, <laughs> websites. And if you just got one, great, just go there and you'll find everything else from there. But I had to throw everything in there. So yeah, yeah. I'll that's make sure to, to list all those in the show notes, everyone listening so that you Excellent. can find that. So thank you so much again for being here and thank you all for listening. And please, yes, share your stories. I am excited to check out this project as it continues to unfold. And thank you all for listening. We will see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. This is your host, Amanda Testa. And if you have felt a calling while listening to this podcast to take this work to a deeper level, this is your golden invitation. I invite you to reach out. You can contact me at amandatesta.com slash activate. And we can have a heart to heart to discuss more about how this work can transform your life. You can also join us on Facebook and the group Find Your Feminine Fire group. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends. Go to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and a raving review so I can connect with other amazing listeners like yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of the community.